Hello, welcome to the first lecture in the course ECE 1B, freshman seminar with the title Puzzling Problems in Computer Engineering. Uh, this first lecture also includes an introduction to the course and its requirements. My name is Behrouz Parhami. I've been at UCSB since 1988, almost 32 years. And I've been teaching this course, which I designed since 2007. So let me start by telling you why we have this freshman seminar. By the way, this seminar was called ECE1 until a few years ago. And because we introduced another freshman seminar, we called that new one ECE1A and this one ECE1B. So, this is the structure of required courses in computer engineering uh, at the time when this seminar was designed. So the, the, the chart is not up to date uh, with regard to current requirements, but I'm just using it to show you why ECE1, and which later became, became ECE1B, is required. As you see in the first uh, few quarters at UCSB, students take math courses, uh, physics courses, and they don't really see much of real computer engineering uh, until the end of the sophomore year or maybe in junior year. Uh, there are programming courses, CS 10, 20, and so on, but not any advanced computer engineering subject until much later. So we decided to bring ECE1 into the freshman year to sort of get you engaged with computer engineering topics and uh, sort of not lose, it, uh, not lose touch with your major area because you're taking so many other courses in math, physics, and so on. So what is a puzzling problem? That's the first question I'm going to ask. Uh, there are really two types of puzzling problems. One type uh, is a problem that looks deceptively simple, but when you start working on it, you see that it's, it's really complex. It, it has hidden complexity. And a good example of that is Rubik's Cube. When you look at this, somebody gave you a Rubik's Cube for the first time and said, okay, turn these faces so that the colors are adjusted. Uh, you may not think that this is a hard thing to do. You'll start turning the faces, and then after a few minutes, you see that it's not really as easy as it looked in the beginning. A second type of problem is, puzzling problem, is one that appears very difficult at first glance, or even impossible but it's readily tamed with the correct insight. If you develop the correct insight, then it becomes easy. So it looks hard, but it's really not that hard. So this is a very good example of that. The problem is for you to connect all these nine dots that appear in a grid by drawing four straight lines, and those four straight lines should be drawn without lifting uh, your pencil or pen from the paper. Let me show you. So here, let's say I start from this upper left dot and then I draw a line horizontally to the right. So that's one line. 
and I'm not lifting my pen, so I draw a second line going down in the last column. And then I draw my third line like this. So I've not connected all the dots except two of them. This one over here and this one. And my pen is at this point and I'm not allowed to lift the, the pen. And I'm allowed to draw just one more line. You see that it's impossible. Okay, I can't draw a line from here, from this lower left corner to connect the remaining two dots here. Okay, so I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to think about this. Try different options and see if you can draw four lines. Of course, the lines do not have to be horizontal and vertical. They can be diagonal too. So here's another example. Start from here. Draw a line going diagonally like this. So that's one line. Then draw a line going up. That's two lines. Then draw a line going diagonally this way. That's three lines. But now you're left with this, this, and this. Three dots still to be connected. Your pen is here, and you're only allowed one more line to draw. So this isn't a good way to do it either. It doesn't work. Okay? So let's think about this. Draw four lines without, four straight lines without lifting your pencil from the paper in such a way that the lines connect all nine dots. Maybe rather than me waiting here, you can just pause the video and work on this and then. Okay, that's a more efficient way of doing it. So I will be sending you an email message basically asking you to be patient as we try this new mode of instruction for the first time for, the, for this course. So I will learn how to do things as we proceed through the quarter. So let me reveal the solution here. That's line one, or a solution, that there are multiples. That's line two. Notice that that line extends outside the box. You might say that this is uh, an example of outside the box thinking. As long as you confine yourself to that box, you won't be able to solve this problem. So that's line two. That's line three. And that's line four. Okay, so I drew four lines without picking up the pencil from the paper, and I connected all nine dots. So as I said, this is an example of a problem uh, that becomes easy to solve once you develop the right insight for solving it. In this example, the right insight is basically not confining yourself to insight the box containing the nine dots, but feeling free to go outside that box. Now, many engineering problems are puzzle-like, especially in computer engineering. And I developed this course because, of course, I'm passionate about computer engineering. I've been teaching it for almost 50 years. And I also like puzzles. So this course sort of combines the those two passions. In this course, each lecture starts with one or more puzzles. We will try to solve the puzzles and discuss possible solution methods. Then I introduce you to computer engineering problems that are related to the puzzles we discussed. So basically, the solution methods for the puzzles transfer to solutions for those practical uh, computer engineering problems. And the problems we'll discuss are both 
the type of practical problems that engineers encounter in their daily work, and also state-of-the-art or frontiers of research problems that are what researchers study as they work in computer engineering. Now, this slide shows the normal grading requirements and expectations for the course. This does not apply to the current quarter because, as I said, for the first time, we are teaching this course online. So there is no presence in classroom so that we cannot take attendance. Normally, grading of this course is based on attendance only. There are no homeworks, no exams. Okay, But this quarter is different, which is this next slide. So for the sake of this quarter, I'm going to define presence and absence in the following way. So I still require you to have no more than two absences. Three or more absences will lead to an automatic not pass grade for the course. If you have no absence, zero absence, then you get an automatic pass at the end of the quarter. Nothing, you don't need to do anything to earn that if you have no absences. If you have just one absence, all I ask you to do is to send me email to explain that absence. An explanation is can be anything. You, you won't be judged for your explanation, okay? So it's good enough to say, um, I forgot about the class, or I went surfing, or you know went out with friends, whatever. Any explanation will do as long as you own up to that absence. You explain what happened. If you have two absences, you can still pass the course, but you need to take a final oral exam, during which we will discuss the two missed lectures. So you'll study those two lectures. You'll come to my office and we'll discuss the two lectures. And if I see that you have already you have looked at the slides for, for that, those lectures and you understand the basic problems discussed, then I'll give you a pass based on that oral exam. So how do you establish presence in class? You establish presence by sending your answers via email at the address that you see on this slide. Use the subject line shown here. In other words, the subject line should read ECE1B, comma, spring 2020, colon, attendance, and then the date of the class for which you are trying to establish attendance. So for example, the first lecture will be March 30th. So you will write in the subject line 03 for MM, and 3030 for DD. So that subject line basically tells me that this email is an attendance email for a particular lecture. And then in the email, you include answers A1 through A4 to Q1 through Q4. And these questions are scattered among the slides for the lecture. So as, as I go through this first lecture, you will see the four questions for this lecture. What you need to do is to send me an email and then say, A1, describe your answer in the body of the email. A2, describe your answer, and so on, up to A4. And then on occasion, answering a question may involve drawing a diagram or doing something that requires graphics. In those cases, you attach the graph or diagram to your email as a JPEG, JPEG file. Okay, so a JPEG file attached to the email will be used to answer questions that require uh, graphics to answer. Okay, so let's now enter into the subject matter for today. Um, the title for this lecture is Easy, Hard, Impossible. 
Okay, puzzles basically have levels of difficulty. Some are easy, some are medium, some are difficult, and some are impossible. In other words, they're not solvable. So they're not real puzzles in that sense that you can work and solve them, but uh, they're impossible problems. So the first one, an easy puzzle. Here's a description of the puzzle. Form a sequence of number pairs or integers in the following way. Begin with any two positive integers as the first pair. In each step, the next number pair consists of, so I'm trying to define two numbers. The first of the numbers in the next step is the smaller of the current pair of values. And the second number is their difference. And you stop this process when the two numbers in the pair become equal. Now this will become much more clear as I give you an example. So let's say I start with the number pair 10, 15. Then the next number pair will be the smaller of those two, 10, and the difference of those two, the larger minus the smaller. 15 minus 10 is 5. In the next step, the smaller of the two numbers is 5, so I write 5. And then the difference between 10 and 5 is 5. And at this point, I hit the condition that the two numbers in the pair are equal, so I stop. So that's the end of the process. So start with two numbers, proceed in the way that is described in the puzzle statement, and then stop when the two numbers become equal. So at this point you may ask, oh, how can I be sure that the two numbers will become equal? Well, that's something that you have to think about and answer. Here's another example, 22 and 6. The smaller of those two is 6, the difference is 16. Now 6 and 16, the smaller is 6, the difference is 10. 6 and 10, the smaller is 6, the difference is 4. 6 and 4, the smaller is 4, the difference is 2. And finally, 4 and 2, the smaller is 2, the difference is 2. And again, we have encountered the condition for stopping, and therefore we stop at that point. Just one more example, 923. And this is what you get. Sometimes you need more steps to get to the end of the process where the two numbers become equal. So the question is, does this process end? How can I be sure that it always ends? This is question one for this lecture. Why is the process outlined above guaranteed to end? So you need to explain a couple of sentences is all, all that it takes to explain this. Why is the process outlined above guaranteed to end? So as a challenge, you can do on your own, repeat this process for a few more starting number pairs and see if you can discover something about how the final number pair is related to the starting values. So for, in the first example in this slide, how is 5 related to the two numbers 10 and 15 that we started with? In the second example, how is 2 related to the numbers 22 and 6 that we started with? In the third example, how is the number 1 at the end related to 9 and 23? So this is for you to answer. It's not part of the, the questions for which you have to submit answers. This is for you to just, if you're curious, try to find out. Now here is a second puzzle. It's a little bit more difficult than the previous one. Again, it deals with sequence, sequence of numbers. Form a sequence of numbers or integers as follows. Begin with any two numbers, so it starts just like the previous one. You begin with any two numbers. 
as the first two elements of the sequence. In each step, the next number is the sum of the last two numbers that you already wrote. Okay, and in this case, you don't go on until you reach a termination condition, but you are asked to generate the jth number in the sequence. So j is given to you. So the process is given to you, and the j, which is the element in the sequence that we are looking for, okay, you have to determine what the jth number in the sequence is. So let's do some examples. 5 and 16. So these are the first two numbers given to me. The next number in the sequence will be the sum of 5 and 16, which is 21. Oh, oh, by the way, I'm asking you to find the fourth number in this sequence. So I've given you two numbers. The third number is 21. And the fourth number is 21 plus 16, which is 37. Okay, I ask you to derive the fourth number in the sequence. So the answer is 37. If you start with 5 and 16. Now suppose you start with 2 and 0. As I said, any two numbers can be the starting point. And I want you to give me the ninth number in this sequence. And again, you can do the calculations. 2 plus 0 is 2. Okay, this is the 2 plus 0 is 2. Then 2 plus 0, these are the last two, is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 2 is 6, and so on. And this is the ninth number, so the answer in this case is 26. The answer to this puzzle, when you start with 2 and 0, and you're looking for the ninth element in the sequence, is 26. A third example, if you start with 1 and 1, so you get 2 as the next number, and I want you to find the 12th number in this sequence. So 1 and 1 is 2, 2 and 1 is 3, 3 and 2 is 5, 5 and 3 is 8, and the 12th number in the sequence is 144. You may recognize this sequence as the Fibonacci sequence. In fact, the previous two were also Fibonacci sequences, but if, uh, they don't start with the standard 1-1, one, one, which is what the standard Fibonacci sequences start with, 1-1. One, one. In this case, you start with 2-0. In this case, you start with 5-16. So this is called Fibonacci sequence. So that's Fibonacci, the first Fibonacci number, the second Fibonacci number, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. So basically, I may ask you to give me the 25th Fibonacci number, and then you start with 1, 1. And so this is the first and second one are given to you, and then you just build the sequence until you get to the 25th, and that would be the answer. Okay, if you take the ratios of these numbers, one number divided by the previous one, one divided by one is one, two divided by one is two, three divided by two is 1.5, five divided by three is 1.67 approximately, eight divided by five, 8 divided by 5 is 1.6, and so on. This ratio tends to a particular value, converges to a particular value, as j goes to infinity. So the ratio of the j plus first, first Fibonacci number to the j Fibonacci number tends to a limit what is the limit? So this is question two that you need to answer. And here's a challenge. 
So if I ask you to find the 1000 Fibonacci number, do you really have to sit down and just generate 1000 numbers to tell me what the 1000th one is? Or is there a formula for the 1000th number? I'll answer this question later on during the lecture. So is there a formula that yields the Jade Fibonacci number directly, that is without forming the sequence Fib1, Fib2, Fibj, and this sequence can be very long if J is large. Okay, so if you want the 1000 Fibonacci number, you have to spend a lot of time generating this sequence. Is there a formula that directly gives you Fib 1000, for example? Okay, so this is now the third puzzle, which is very hard. In fact, as of today, it's impossible. Nobody has been able to solve it, but nobody has been has proven that it's not solvable either. So form a sequence of numbers, integers as follows. Begin with a given number. To find the next number in each step, you do one of two things. You have the current number if it's even, or triple it and add one if it's odd. Okay, so if the number is even, you divide it by two. If it's odd, you triple it and add one. Okay, so let's see some examples. Start with five, which is odd, so you triple to 15 and add one. Now 16 is even, so you divide by 2. 8 is even, you divide by 2. 4 is even, you divide by 2. 2 is even, you divide by 2. When you get to 1, you stop. The reason you stop at this point is that you could continue, but let's see what happens if we continue. 1 is odd, so triple and add 1, you get 4. 4 is even, divide by 2, you get 2. 2 is even, divide by 2, you get 1. So this pattern 4 to 1 will continue indefinitely from this point on. So 1 becomes 4, 4 becomes 2, 2 becomes 1, and then again 4 to 1, 4 to 1, never stops. So as soon as you get to 1, you stop. Here's another example. I start with 22, which is even. Divide by 2, you get 11. That's odd. So triple and add 1, you get 34. Divide by 2, 17. Triple and add 1. So triple to 51 and then add 1. Divide by 2, divide by 2. Triple to 39 and add 1, 40. Divide by 2, divide by 2, you get 10. Divide by 2, you get 5. Now at this point, I don't I know what will happen after this because I already did the process for 5 up here. So the same numbers will appear and the sequence will get to 1 and we stop at that point. Okay, a third example, it took 15 steps. The first example took us five steps, okay? One, two, three, four, five. And this one took 15 steps to end. Here is starting with nine. And this one takes 19 steps to get to 1. Notice that when I got to 11, I know what happens from that point on because 11 appeared here. So the same numbers basically will appear here and it takes 19 steps. Okay, so repeat this process for 27 and some other starting values. 
See if you can discover something about how various sequences end. In other words, do all sequences end in the same way? Or do they fall into several categories? Or they do not show any overall pattern at all? Now the answer for 27 is revealed in the next slide. So if you want to experiment with it, you can pause the lecture and work on the number 27 as the starting value. I don't expect you to finish the process for 27 because it's a very long process. But just go maybe for 10, 20 steps and see what happens, what numbers you get in the sequence if you start with 27. So here is the Collatz. So this is called the Collatz sequence. Collatz was a mathematician who first observed this, the properties of this particular way of forming sequences. So in his honor, the, this, these types of sequences are known as Collatz sequences. So for 27, here is what happens. Get ready here. The process goes on for a very long time. It does end in one eventually. But in the process, as you go through this, you get some very weird, very large numbers. 7,288 here. 9,232, that's the largest number that you get. But eventually, the numbers start decreasing, and then they go down to 1 at the end here. It takes 111 steps for this. So a natural question is, how is the number of steps related to the number we start with? Okay, For 5, we got 5 steps. For 22, we got 15 steps. For 9, we got 19 steps. So is the number of steps some sort of a function of the starting value? It is a function because eventually all these sequences end, although nobody is sure that every sequence will end. More on this in a few minutes. But let's assume that all these sequences end, they reach one, and the number of steps sort of seem to be unrelated to the starting number. It's not a simple function of the starting number. So 27 is only slightly larger than the numbers you see on this slide, yet it takes 111 steps. Here's the third question that you need to answer. Find the largest integer whose collapsed sequence has n steps. In other words, what, what is the largest number that requires three steps? OK, let me go back to the previous step. Five required five steps, OK? What is the largest number that requires five steps? 22 required 15 steps. What is the largest number that requires 15 steps? in this process. Is it 1,000? Is it 2,000? What is the largest number that requires 19 steps? OK, so I want your answer to be, in general, for n. So what is the largest number integer whose collapse sequence has n steps? So that's the third question for you to answer. So here are the three puzzles next to each other. And the point of putting all of these next to each other is to show you that in terms of the problem statement, the three puzzles that are very difficult in term, very different in terms of uh, level of difficulty, they don't look much different in terms of the statement. In fact, the hardest puzzle at the bottom has the shortest description or statement. So when you look at the statement of a problem, it doesn't really give you an idea of how difficult it is. The Euclid sequence at the top is pretty easy. 
Fibonacci sequence is a little bit more difficult, not much. And the collapse sequence, well, forming the sequence is basically mechanical, it's not hard, it's just a lot of work. But answering questions about the properties of the sequence is extremely difficult. And in fact, hundreds of mathematicians have worked on this problem, and they still don't know the answer to some fundamental questions about this collapse sequence. Okay, so let's dig deeper a little bit. The Euclid sequence basically corresponds to an algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor of two numbers x and y. And this is basically a recursive process, a recursive algorithm. The greatest common divisor of x and y is x if the two numbers x and y are equal. So if x is equal to y, then output x and stop. Otherwise, compute the greatest common divisor of two other numbers. What are those two other numbers? The smaller value among x and y and the absolute value of the difference between the two numbers. <clears throat> So basically, when I start with 15 and 5, those are the first two numbers, x and y. I execute this algorithm. It says if 15 is equal to 5, okay, that condition is not true. So I go to the otherwise statement. Then find the greatest common divisor of the smaller of the two numbers, 5, and the difference of the two numbers, which is 10. So to find the greatest common divisor of 5 and 15, you are referred to finding the greatest common divisor of 5 and 10. And then you continue this process until you get to the greatest common divisor of 5 and 5. And then at that point, you know that the greatest common divisor is 5 because x is equal to y at that point. So here's a Simple analysis of this algorithm. How, what is the worst case number of steps that this algorithm needs? Well, if you start with the numbers 1 and n, that leads to the largest number of steps because you take the smaller of the two, 1, and the difference between the two, which is n minus 1. Then in the next step, the smaller is 1, the difference is n minus 2. So it basically takes you n minus 1 steps okay, to figure out at the end that the greatest common divisor between 1 and n is equal to 1. Okay, For some other numbers, you require fewer steps, but in the worst case, you need roughly n steps. So we say the complexity of this algorithm is n step. It's order n algorithm. So when the number of steps is a polynomial function of the problem size, the problem is considered computationally easy or tractable. So n minus 1, of course, is a polynomial in n, so this problem is tractable. In other words, if you give it to a computer, it takes a fraction of one second to solve it for you. Okay, so let me skip this slide. You can read these skipped slides on your own if you are interested. They are not essential to the message that I'm trying to uh, convey in this lecture. So some difficult looking problems are actually easy, not that hard. So Fibonacci sequence is an example of such problems. So here is algorithm for finding the jth Fibonacci number. So set x equal to 1 and y equal to 1. These are basically the last two terms in the sequence. Initially, they are 1 and 1. 
So because we are interested in the jth number, we have to repeat j minus 2 times. Because two numbers in the sequence are given, we need to generate j minus 2 additional numbers. So here's what I do. Set z to x plus y, compute x plus y. Then set x to y, the previous value of y, and y to the value of z. So if you execute this algorithm, you generate you generate the j number in the sequence. So the running time of this algorithm, or the running time of your program, if you inc if you code this in some programming language, will be proportional to j. Because for each additional term, you have to do a few calculations. You have to do an addition. You have to do two other assignment statements. So for each iteration, for each new term, you, you have to do some work, a little bit of work. So the running time is proportional to j. So if I ask you, what is the millionth term of Fibonacci sequence? You have to generate one million, roughly one million terms, and that may take a long time. Okay, so here's a quicker solution. If your j parameter j is large, there's a formula for the j Fibonacci number. Some of you may have seen this. So the j Fibonacci number is a ratio. In the denominator, you have square root of 5, denominator. In the numerator, you have 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 to the power j minus 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 to the power j. So you can write the program so that it evaluates this expression for any given j. So if I tell you what is the millionth term in the Fibonacci sequence, you just run your program with the input parameter j equal to 1 million or 1,000, whatever number I gave you. Okay, so you don't need to compute a million terms, but you just use this formula. But the derivation of this formula is very interesting, but one interesting part of this formula is that the first number in the brackets, 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, is a very famous number. It's called the golden ratio. So it's interesting that the golden ratio appears here. It's roughly 1.618 and so on. It's an irrational number, so that it has an infinite number of digits. It's roughly 1.62, okay? The golden ratio. So basically, if I ask you, is this num is this uh, problem difficult to solve? If you did not know this formula, the answer may be yes, because if I give you a large value for j, you may be stuck for hours or days or maybe even weeks generating all the terms. But once you know this formula, the problem becomes easy. So it takes perhaps a few seconds of computation time, or maybe even a fraction of seconds to just evaluate this formula. So that leads us to question number four, the last question for today's lecture. Now Fibonacci numbers are integers, right? You start with one, one, then you go to two, then three, then five, they're all integers. But this formula contains square root of five, which is an irrational number, okay? Why is it that when I use this formula, even though it contains square root of five here, here, 
and here the result the answer to evaluating this formula is an integer okay so I'll explain briefly how is it that the formula that contains square root of 5 once evaluated yields an integer so the rest of the time I will spend on the collapse sequence, which is the most interesting of the three sequences we have discussed. It looks like an easy problem. It's certainly easy to describe, easy to understand what's being asked of us, but extremely difficult to answer the question posed in general. So here is the collapse algorithm the collapse sequence for n, print n and set x equal to n, while x is greater than 1, because we, we want to continue the sequence until we reach 1. So while x is greater than 1, we have not reached 1, repeat this process. If x is even, then divide x by 2, set x equal to x over 2, otherwise set x to 3x plus 1. In either case, print the new value of x. So the next term of the sequence will be printed, and we repeat this until we reach 1. We don't know what the number of steps will be for n. We don't even know whether it is always finite. In other words, we don't know whether in a finite number of steps for any given value of n, this process leads you to 1. Collatz, the mathematician, conjectured that for any starting value, the sequence does reach 1. Okay, So this is known as Collatz's conjecture. It's a conjecture because he didn't prove it and nobody else has been, even, has been able to prove it. Maybe someday somebody will prove it, but so far nobody has been successful. So the truth of this conjecture has not been verified or contradicted. Because it's possible that in some future time somebody says, no, this is not this conjecture is not true. Here is a number that never reaches one if you apply the process to it. However, there is strong evidence suggesting that the conjecture is true. It has been experimentally verified for values of n up to 5.76 times 10 to the 18. That's a huge number. Okay, for all values of n up to 5.76 times 10 to the 18, we know that the sequence reaches 1 and therefore stops. Okay, but this does not prove because there may be some number larger than that 5.76 times 10 to the 18 for which the sequence does not reach 1. And nobody knows whether such a number exists. So how do we get a handle on such difficult problems? We haven't been able to solve the problem, but we haven't been sitting idle either. We have been analyzing the problem and looking for handles. Now, interestingly, in the field of computer engineering, computer engin engineers not only deal with computer as an object of study, but also as a tool for doing the study. So computer as a double function, okay, it's, it's the object of study for us, and it's also a tool that enables us to study it. So here are two diagrams, the reference from which they come as given at the bottom of the slide. It shows the distribution of the number of steps for different starting numbers. So for example, 200, if you start with the number 200, well, one of these, I don't know exactly which one, one of these dots here, this may be for 200. 
this is how many steps it takes. For 300, so each of these dots represents the number of steps needed to reach one. If you remember in the previous slide, we know for numbers up to that value that we will reach one. So obviously for smaller numbers up to a thousand, we will e always reach one. Okay, and this is the distribution for a wider range. This one goes from one to 1,000. This one goes from one to 10,000. Again, you will see here an interesting pattern. The number of steps are not completely random, but vary according to a pattern. So you see a pattern in this diagram. So perhaps that pattern provides a clue as to what is happening and how many steps we need. Okay, this slide again, I'm going to skip. By the way, any of these slides, if you are interested and you look at them and you encounter difficulty understanding uh, what's in them, uh, feel free to contact me during my office hours, uh, which are Mondays 3 to 4 and Wednesdays uh, 3 to 5. Okay, you can also send me email if you have just a brief question that can be that can be answered quickly. But if it's a question that needs uh, extensive discussion, then uh, showing up in person uh, to my office hour would be the best way to deal with it. Okay, so here is another easy looking but very difficult problem. It's called the subset sum problem. Given a set of n numbers, determine whether there is a subset of the set whose sum is a given value x. So here's an example for this subset sum problem. The set S consists of the numbers 3, negative 4, 32, negative 25, 6, 10, negative 9, 50. And I'm asking you whether there's a subset of this set whose numbers add to 22. So basically the subset sub some problem consists of a set, the inputs are a set, and a target sum, in this case 22. And this is an instance of the problem, in other words, a specific instance of the problem with this particular set and this particular target sum. So when you say a problem is difficult, it doesn't mean that every instance of the problem is difficult, but the problem is difficult in general. In other words, if you try to write a program to solve the subset sum problem for any set S and any target sum X, then an efficient algorithm for this does not exist. In other words, the best you can do is just try all the subsets. And a set with n numbers in it has to the power n subsets. So if you have a thousand numbers, you have two to the one thousand subsets, which is an enormous number. And just trying those subsets takes perhaps months or years of a computer's time to just try out all of those and see if we can get to this target sum. Okay, so for example, uh, subsets are the empty, empty set, a subset with one element, 3, negative 4, 32. None of those subsets, of course, give you 22. Subsets of two values, 3 and negative 4. They sum to negative 1, so that's not what we want. Negative 4 and 32. 32 and negative 25 and quite a few of those. Okay, so this is not really a good way to solve a problem, trying 
an exponential number of possibilities takes a long time if this set is large. But for this particular problem, we can argue and find actually the answer. Such problems in the parlance of computational complexity are known as MP-hard. Don't worry about what MP-hard means. It means they're difficult to solve. It takes a long time to solve them. But a specific instance may be easily solvable. For example, in this case, I say, okay, I want to target sum 22. Okay, look at the positive members of this set. If I exclude 32 and 50, the other positive numbers are in the set are 3. Oops, I lost the cursor. The other positive numbers in the set are 3, 6, and 10. If I choose all three of them in the subset, 3 plus 6 plus 10 is 19. It's not quite large enough to form 22. And of course, negative numbers don't help increase that sum. So that means that of the two values, 32 and 50, at least one of them must be included in the solution. Okay? So basically, for this particular instance of making progress without having to try all possibilities, I'm getting a handle on how to solve it. So let's say I include 32. Of course, when I include 32, I'm aiming for 22. I need to form negative 10 from the rest of the elements. And it's easy to see by inspection that negative 10 is formed by using 3, 3, negative 9, and negative 4. And therefore, the subset of the set that sums to 22 will be 32, 3, negative 9, and negative 4. So I found the answer to this particular instance of the problem. But if I wanted to write a program to solve such problems in general, the program would have basically to try all possible subsets. There's no fundamentally faster algorithm for solving this problem. Okay, let me give you, as the last part of today's lecture, another easy looking but hard problem. This is known as the traveling salesperson problem. Given a set of N cities with known travel costs between them, So cities going from city I to city J has the cost CIJ. And that cost may be cost in money if we are purchasing a plane ticket, or it can be the cost in terms of uh, time that we spend, the driving time between the two cities. We want to find a path of least cost that would take a salesperson through all cities returning to the starting city. So this particular salesperson starts at city A and aims to visit all the cities and then return to A. So for example, salesperson can go from A to D, D to F, F to B, B to E, E to C, C to A. That's one solution. Okay, so if I use that solution, the cost will be 5 plus 2, that's 7, plus 1, that's 8, plus 4, that's 12, plus 3, that's 15, plus 1, that's 16. So I found a path of cost 16 for this problem. So the question is, is that the best path? In other words, is there a faster way or lower cost way 
to achieve the same thing. Start from A, visit every city, and then end up back at A. So let's try another path. A to B, that's 2. B to F, 2 plus 1 is 3. F to D, 3 plus 2 is 5. 5 plus 5 is 10, gets us to E. 10 plus 3 is 13. 13 plus 1 is 14. So that solution has a cost 14. Is So the objective of this problem is to find the lowest cost. And again, you see why the problem is difficult, because there are, in general, many paths. And there's no way to know ahead of time which of those paths leads to the lowest cost. You basically have to try all of them, determine the cost, and then pick the lowest cost one from among all the possible solutions. This is also an MP heart problem. Again, a particular instance of the problem, like the one shown here, may be easily solvable. But algorithms for solving the problem in general, they may take a long time to run. They have exponential running time in the worst case. So here are some paths. In fact, there is a path that takes only 13, cost 13. There are actually two such paths. Okay. So the question here is, is can I do better than 13 in this particular example? The answer may be yes or no. I don't know what it's going to be. Okay. So that's basically... The first lecture, uh, I will communicate with you through Gaucho Space, sending you messages there, leaving uh, uh, basically announcements and so on. Uh, I will also post uh, the link to the videos that I record. Unfortunately, we cannot have live discussion this quarter. Eventually, maybe if this uh, uh, condition continues and we are forced to do online courses in the fall or during summer, by then we will learn a little bit more and be able to uh, hold classes in which you can interact with the instructor. I don't yet know how to do that, so I've decided to record the lectures, give you the link. You can watch the lecture at your leisure. It doesn't have to be any particular time. And then interact with me through sending me email or visiting me during my office hours. Okay, don't forget that you need to submit answers to the four questions that you saw during today's lecture by sending me an email with a specific uh, subject line, the format for which was given through the presentation, and then answers to the four questions given in the body of your email. And for today's lecture, no diagrams are involved in the answers. So just the email with the text answers will be sufficient. When I get your email, I will just look at it if you don't send email, you will be considered absent. If you do send email, if you actually tried, you'll be considered present. Unless your email is really off the mark, okay, and doesn't say anything interesting or useful about the questions that I asked you, you will get present for sending me email with reasonable answers. They don't have to be correct answers necessarily but you have to try, okay? No email means absent. And then through the quarter, if you have no absence, in other words, if you send me emails for every single lecture, you get a pass. If you have one absence and you send me email to explain the absence, you still get a pass. 
If you have two absences, you can take an oral final exam and we'll schedule that near the end of the quarter. And you can still pass the course if you pass the oral final exam. Three or more absences, there's no way for you to pass the course. Okay, uh, thank you and I'll see you uh, in the second lecture or perhaps during interactions for office hours. Bye.